Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Williams, Dean of the Faculty at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and welcome to this program. Three weeks ago, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. The public health implications of that action are enormous. Nearly 60% of American women of reproductive age live in states that are hostile to abortion rights. That amounts to 40 million women and girls. As soon as the ruling was announced, about half the states in the nation moved to ban all or most abortion. Put simply, access to this fundamental component of healthcare is in historic crisis. Tens of millions of girls and women have lost or are losing their human right to choose what is best for their own bodies, their own health, their own futures, and even their own lives. Meanwhile, conservative lawmakers and judges, many without discernible grounding in public health, or in some instances, without understanding of basic female biology, have decided that they know best. Let's envision a future that they seek to create. The people disproportionately affected will be young women, women of color and low income women. States that ban abortion will see a large surge in unintended births. About 180,000 is the low scientific estimate of unintended births. And an increase of about 10% annual total births in these states. That in turn will trigger an increase in maternal deaths, particularly among women of color. We know that already the number of women who die during or shortly after childbirth in the United States are at higher risks than anywhere in the developed world. In fact, way higher especially for black women. This is an, a horrifying statistic and it is going to get worse. These abortion bans will also deepen societal inequities. The states with which there are the most restrictive abortion laws invest the least in policies and programs that support family well-being. They also have the worst outcomes on key indicators of maternal and child health. Republican lawmakers are silent on the public health risks of forcing girls and women to carry unintended and unwanted pregnancies. But there are many such risks and the silence is not acceptable. Not only will we see more maternal mortality we will also see an increase in infant mortality, preterm deliveries, and developmental difficulties, as well as exposure of many more women and children to significant trauma whose lifelong physical and mental health effects will trigger intergenerational harm. I know that for many of us who care, it will feel easy to be hopeless, but we cannot give in to despair. So here is my message to you all. Clarity is power. The American people need a clear understanding of the science and of the evidence on the consequences of depriving girls and women of this essential component to healthcare. Already polls show a strong majority of Americans are opposed to overturning Roe versus Raid. I predict that strong majority will become an overwhelming majority in the months ahead, especially if we continue to shine a spotlight on the real life consequences of this ruling. Today's studio event will help in this effort. Our panel includes scholars as well as practitioners from across Harvard University, experts in gender, race, and the history of public health, 
experts in political theory and practice and in constitutional law. Together, our panelists will offer a roadmap, a way for us to collectively think ourselves forward. I hope it will be the first of many steps in demonstrating the power of clarity. And so with that, I'd like to kick things over to our moderator, Gabriella Border, a national correspondent for routers, routers who has been closely covering abortion politics in the United States. Thank you, Gabriella, and over to you. Thank you very much, Dean Williams. I'm thrilled to be moderating this esteemed panel today. As we explore the impacts of the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, we're going to look at several different uh, facets of this occurrence. We are going to look at some of the factors that got us to this point, the murky medical and legal landscape that we are currently facing. And most saliently, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to walk us a little bit through the path forward. Along the way, we will assess some of the actual or proposed responses to the Supreme Court decision, including a newly announced Reproductive Rights Task Force and President Biden's executive order. Helping us navigate today, I would like to introduce each of our panelists. We have Evelyn Hammonds, Barbara Gutmann Rosencrantz Professor of the History of Science, Professor of African and African American Studies, and Professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Elizabeth Janiak, Assistant Professor at Harvard Medical School and Harvard Chan School, Research Investigator at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Director of Social Science Research at Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts. Jane Mansbridge, Adams Professor of Political Leadership and Democratic Values Emerita at Harvard Kennedy School, and Mary Ziegler, Professor at UC Davis School of Law and a recent visiting professor of constitutional law at Harvard Law School. We have received many audience questions and I will try to get to uh, some of those as we move through our conversation today. We have a lot to go over. First, I'd like to start um, by doing a lightning round uh, with all of our panelists. We've had a couple of weeks to digest the fact that the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. There are going to be many repercussions for years to come from this decision. But what is one repercussion um, that is top of mind uh, for each of you? We'll go around. Um, so let's start with Evelyn. Would you like to kick us off? Well, I think it's been an incredibly depressing and despairing time. I think the first thing I keep thinking about is the numbers of women, uh, especially poor women of color, poor African-American women, who will be put under undue stress uh, almost immediately uh, as a result of this decision. I just, my heart just breaks to think that with, within a number of weeks, uh, people will have limited, increasingly limited access to both abortion services, but also all kinds of maternal health and uh, reproductive uh, issues that they need to have addressed. It, it is, it's a dim moment. Jenny, would you like to follow? Um, I agree completely. Uh, and um, I would also stress uh, the harms of abortion bans for the existing children of women who seek abortions. That's something we don't often talk about and I think is extremely important. And I also worry that if Republicans get control of the House, Senate and presidency, they'll seek a federal ban on abortion. Liz, go over to you. Thanks. Um, you know, I'd like to amplify something that Evelyn said and underscore the concerns about folks um, suffering medical consequences. Any pregnancy capable individual in this country who is living in, traveling to, or even just passing through a state with an abortion ban could find their health and life in danger because providers will feel constrained to intervene even during medical emergencies when people are pregnant. Um, and so that is definitely something that keeps me up at night. And Mary. I think the thing that struck me probably the most is the, the really profound effect of the uncertainties that this decision has created. There's uncertainty, you know, at multiple levels. There's uncertainty about what states are actually going to do. There's uncertainty about what the laws that are already on the books mean, because many of them were written 
really, frankly, not to go into effect. They were written at a time when no one expected Roe v. Wade to be overturned. And those multiple layers of uncertainty are making providers more hesitant to provide even care that people in the anti-abortion movement say they should be providing. Um, it's made patients, I think, reluctant to seek care because they're uncertain about whether in some instances they're violating the law. And so um, it's not just a matter of what obvious criminal prohibitions are doing to people. It's the layers of uncertainty making people um, even worse off, I think, than they otherwise would be. And I think that uncertainty is likely to continue because the anti-abortion movement's fragmenting. Practitioners are facing, I think criminal laws, it's worth emphasizing, unlike anything we've seen before. We've had criminal laws before, but the prototypical criminal enforcement of a pre-row abortion ban would be like five years in prison. We're seeing trigger bans now with penalties like 99 years in prison, life in prison. And so those penalties are creating a greater hesitation on the part of providers to do anything because the problem, if you get it wrong, is you not only lose your license, you lose your liberty for an extended period of time. So I've been struck by all of that. Thank you, each of you, for those thoughts to start us off. Um, we have a very full conversation ahead of us. It's no secret to anyone uh, watching this panel and anyone participating that abortion is a very polarizing issue uh, in America. Um, I have Pew Research data in front of me, uh, a survey done in March that shows that the majority of Americans do believe that abortion should be legal in all or most cases. This is not an isolated poll. This polling on this has been Consistent um, for a while, it is a very divisive issue, but the majority of Americans do believe that abortion should be legal in most cases. But now we are looking at a legal landscape in this country where about half of U.S. states are expected to ban or severely restrict abortion. A lot of them already have done that in the weeks um, since Roe v. Wade was overturned. So tensions are running very high, um, not surprising. But to illustrate that, I wanted to bring in a clip, courtesy of Reuters, if our tech team could play um, our first clip. Pastor Doug Wilson leads Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho. Wilson believes that Idaho should adopt even more stringent laws on abortion, banning it without exception, even when the mother's life is at risk. And Wilson told Reuters he thinks political tensions over abortion could erupt into mass violence. I don't think the United States has been this divided since the late 1850s. Right. So I think we are, I think we honestly are at civil war levels of hostility and tension. Thank you. Mary, I want to turn to you. You are a legal expert and you have long studied the anti-abortion movement. The overturning of Roe v. Wade was not something that happened overnight. It was the product of a decades long campaign by the anti-abortion movement. Um, so in a short summary, how did we get to June 24th? I think probably the important thing to emphasize is that some of this was about arguments, right? The anti-abortion movement has made arguments for decades that were made by Justice Alito and the majority decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, um, arguments that Roe had distorted other areas of the law, arguments that uh, Roe destroyed our, our politics and polarized us. Um, the opinion really resembles actually articles written by anti-abortion folks that were draft opinions overruling Roe v. Wade. But I think the important thing to emphasize is that this is not about primarily about reasoning and persuasion, because those arguments have quite literally been around since the 1970s and 80s. This is about ways that our democratic institutions have changed in fundamental ways to make this moment possible. So there have been profound changes to the Republican Party since the 1970s um, that have made the party more, I think, dependent on and willing to listen to. Uh, people in the anti-abortion movement and Christian conservatives writ large. There have been changes to our system of campaign finance that have been relevant and empowered outside spending by anti-abortion groups. There have been changes to the way um, both parties, but certainly to a greater extent, the Republican parties approach Supreme Court confirmation. So looking for justices, not just who are conservative, not just who identified as originalist and textualists, but people who were um, not concerned about the court's reputation or legitimacy or the court's willingness to count, uh, contravene popular opinion. 
all of that was necessary to get to the overruling of Roe, and all of that would the anti-abortion movement would tell you was necessary to get to the overruling of Roe, which means that the aftermath of Roe is, is of concern, not only on, on the basis of public health, which of course we'll be talking about at greater depth in greater depth in a minute, but also just from the standpoint of democracy, right? This was a, a change that required um, fundamental shifts in how our democracy works and how well our democracy works, and all of that was required to produce a decision overruling Roe. Thank you. And uh, to get a little bit further into the public health implications, Evelyn, um, you are a historian of American science and African-American history. And we heard from Dean Williams a little while ago how the overturning of Roe v. Wade will disproportionately impact women of color, poor women. What lessons can we learn from history um, that might help us predict what we are likely to see in the coming years? I think there there are many lessons that that we can learn from the history, but I, one one lesson I really want to highlight in this conversation is that if we look at the um, maternal and infant mortality rates among African American women, and we start in 1900, we see extremely high rates uh, at that moment, and those rates continue to be higher than almost any other group in this country for the, for the rest of the 20th century into the 21st century. There's been a persistent uh, high rates of, of maternal mortality and infant mortality among African-American women. The, the great journalist Linda Villarosa has a new book out talking about some of these issues related also to sterilization abuse and all kinds of, of these kinds of issues that it, for, for many Black feminist scholars and historians and legal uh, uh, folks right now, what we see is the ways in which the history of, of African-American women in particular and enforced, enforced um, um, pregnancy and the absence of bodily autonomy go back to the period of slavery. And that, that issue is something that has not fully been addressed the enforced uh, pregnancies of African-American women under slavery supported the regime of slavery in many ways. And until we come to terms with that history, you know, we see a kind of consistent lack of attention to the impact of, of important in enforcing certain restrictions on bodily autonomy that have a disproportionate impact on African-American women as being part of that long, long legacy. And the only way to get through it is to face that history, to look at that legacy, to see what's actually happening in states with large numbers of African-American women. Let's just take Mississippi, for example, where uh, throughout much of the 20th century into the 21st century, uh, availability of programs for poor African-American women to support their reproductive health overall have been quite limited and now will be sharply, sharply, sharply reduced. That's a really good point you make about the question mark uh, regarding what services, what increase in services will be offered to women in this country who are giving birth, who otherwise would not be giving birth in this time. So I wanna bring in one of our viewer questions, which is related to this point. This one is from Dana. Uh, the question is, how will we care for and support children born to people who are already struggling emotionally and or financially, especially in very red states? Um, maybe I can pass it to Jane. Do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, you know, the anti-abortion movement tends to cast abortion in reference to professional women who just don't want children. Yet half the people who get abortions are below the poverty line, and another quarter are just above the part of poverty line. And 60% already have children. These women care about their children. Uh, they realize, and they're in a far better position than anyone else to realize, that they cannot, at that point in their lives, handle another child. In many cases, they're already struggling with two jobs or no job or no support from a partner to give the children, their children the care they think a child should have. And their decision is they just can't handle another one. Then if they add another to a family that's already stretched to the max, their existing children will suffer. 
And as a country, as Dean Williams said, oh, we should be providing much, much, much more support for struggling families. And the deep red states are doing the least to help. And Republicans in Congress are voting against the federal bills that try to provide support. So what we can do is to make support for children and the role of abortion in that support uh, an issue that's salient in the elections. So that's so one of the options that women who might be forced to carry pregnancy to term now uh, will have is adoption. I wanted to bring in another viewer question on um, the subject of adoption. This question is from Katie. There will be more unwanted pregnancies among teenagers already living in relative poverty. Is it possible for those of us who are in situations where we could easily adopt these children to interact with adoption agencies so that we can lift these babies into better social and economic situations and hence prevent the perpetuation of poverty? Uh, Liz, do you wanna take this one? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I think that this, this question highlights an important truth, which is that young people will have the most trouble getting abortions in the new landscape. They will have the most trouble traveling between states for legal abortion. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes when they travel to a state where abortion is still legal, there are parental consent laws that, per, that put additional barriers in their way. So that's absolutely true. Um, but at a societal level, when we think about the solution to poverty, it's not really individual people's reproductive choices that is the solution to poverty. It is, as Professor Manbridge was uh, just highlighting for us, about social policy. Poverty is produced by social policy and poverty can be addressed by social policy. So I think um, to lift those children out of policy, the solutions are a living wage, closing the wage gap or the wage theft between women and men and women of color in particular, um, increasing affordable housing um, and interventions like that, as well as strengthening our social safety net in terms of both cash benefits and programs like SNAP and WIC that give food to low-income folks. Those are the interventions we need to address poverty, um, and adoption is not the solution to poverty. I think that it's also important to remember that actually teenagers in particular, while they are the most impacted by this um, by, by this ruling, because they will have the least access to abortion, they make up very, very few abortions in the United States. So folks 17 and younger have 3% of all abortions in the United States, and that's because teen pregnancy is um, decreasing and has been for decades. And so most folks who are going to be forced to carry a pregnancy will be between the ages of 18 and 29. They'll be young adults. They will not be teenagers. The last challenge around thinking about um, adoption as an alternative to abortion is that most people who are denied a wanted abortion don't want to place their child for adoption. So there's an excellent study out of the University of California at San Francisco called the Turnaway Study that looked at the outcomes of women who were denied wanted abortions in the United States before Roe was overturned, because unfortunately some women were already being denied wanted abortions due to policy constrictions. And they found that of those women who were compelled to uh, continue their pregnancies, 90% chose parenting, um, only less than 10% chose adoption. So I don't think we're going to see a large increase in adoption because that doesn't actually appeal to people who are forced to continue unwanted pregnancies. Um, and that's just one of the many reasons that I think adoption is not an answer to this much larger problem of how we end poverty through policy interventions. Thank you. That's really interesting because I know adoption um, has been talked a lot about on uh, by people on both sides of, of the issue lately. So that is very clarifying. Um, and I wanted to continue with you, Liz, for a little bit. There are huge medical and healthcare implications of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, whether we're talking about strain on the American healthcare system overall um, or increasing, likely increasing maternal um, mortality and morbidity rates. Um, I want to ask you a viewer question, actually. Uh, let's bring in one from a viewer, Elizabeth, who is asking about this, this very matter. She asks, are doctors in Texas and other states now refusing to treat women with ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages? This is a uh, matter of great concern um, from, by, from voters. I've, I've interviewed a lot of people with this question. So what can you tell us about how doctors are going to be looking at treating women with non-viable pregnancies with um, this new legal landscape? 
Absolutely. Um, doctors are already changing the way that they treat people experiencing pregnancy complications. And Texas is a great example because their six week ban on abortion was allowed to go into effect in September of 2021. We actually have some data on what it looks like to have a near total ban in a very populous state with a lot of pregnant folks. Um, and there was recently some data released from two academic medical centers there showing that when people came into those clinics since the ban was passed, um, excuse me, into those hospitals since the ban was passed and it went into effect in the fall of 2021, were delayed an average of nine days in receiving treatment for their non-viable pregnancies as their doctors waited for something to change in the pregnancy to justify intervention under the law. And that can be that they're waiting for the person to um, go, lose the pregnancy spontaneously, but it's also often that they're waiting for the person to get sick enough that they think it's permissible to intervene under the law. And so when we have doctors um, who are who feel they have to wait until someone's sick enough for that justification, they sometimes get it wrong. And we know from international and historical examples that that has happened everywhere abortion has been outlawed. Um, there was the very high profile case of Savita Halanapavar in Ireland that helped to galvanize legalization there. She was denied um, a, a needed uterine evacuation when she was in the process of miscarrying at 17 weeks of pregnancy uh, because she wasn't sick enough according to the doctors and she did pass away. There are also documented cases in the history of the United States, um, even in states like New York that had more permissive abortion laws in the 1960s before some other states, but they still had some restrictions on people needing to be sick in order to get an abortion. So there have been cases documented in the historical literature as well of folks being admitted to the hospital while ill and then the care team waiting for them to get sicker and sicker until they think it's justified uh, to intervene under the law. And sometimes they get it wrong and people do pass away. So um, these delays and denials of care have always happened in the context of abortion bans. I would be thrilled if we became the first country on earth that managed to not do that, but I am not optimistic that that can happen. It's a really interesting point, especially because a lot of the um, restrict, restrictive abortion laws that we're seeing passed in states make exceptions in cases of medical emergency for the mother or if the mother's life is in danger. But what I'm hearing you say is that that is not always a very clear case scenario when the mother's life is in danger versus when she might suffer injury or health complications from that pregnancy, but it's not necessarily life endangering. Is that is that an issue that you foresee? Absolutely. I mean, what we want is for healthcare providers to be able to do what they think is best for their patient's health. And whenever they are afraid of incarceration, um, as a consequence of making a mistake, they feel very constrained. And that's when they end up um, maybe making choices that end up resulting in serious morbidity and mortality even though it might have been the intention, as, as Mary was saying before, of folks who wrote the law might believe that they've written a law that's supposed to have an exception for that, it's, it's not always a clear-cut line, particularly if you're waiting for someone to get sick enough, to bleed enough, um, to have a severe enough infection. Um, constraining doctors from intervening until they think someone's about to die is, uh, is tying their hands so that they can't do what's best for that person. And even in the course of an inevitable loss, when we're talking about someone who's um, essentially going into labor so early in pregnancy that there's no chance of fetal survival, if there's still a heartbeat in many states, they will feel constrained from intervening in that case. Um, and so I think that will end up with maternal deaths, but also with a lot of severe maternal morbidity. And that's one of the things that we've seen in this early data from Texas that I was talking about. Folks who were admitted to these academic medical centers in Texas, 57% of those women went on to experience um, severe maternal morbidity, which is events like hemorrhage and transfusion, uh, while they were waiting to get sick enough for their doctors to intervene to evacuate their uterus. Thank you for explaining a lot of that. Um in greater depth for our audience. I wanna turn, uh, change topics a little bit and address some of the specific policy proposals that we've seen in the wake of Roe's overturn. So last week, President Biden signed an executive order intended to protect abortion uh, and birth control access. He recently said he's also considering declaring a public health emergency, and the Justice Department has now established a task force on reproductive rights. So another lightning round, let's go around and um, I'd like to hear from each of you your reaction to the federal government's response to the Supreme Court decision so far. And um, maybe we can start with Mary. Um, I think it's very 
It's been pretty hesitant so far. I mean, I think in the past day or two, we've started to see the, the first signs of proposals the Biden administration has that actually have teeth. So the two steps I've been the most um you know, impressed by, I guess, involved EMTALA, so um, federal law that's already been on the books um, dealing with emergency cases of the kind Liz was describing. The Biden administration has said essentially to hospitals that don't abide by the broader definitions of emergency in EMTALA that they could either face fines or be excluded from Medicare. That's the kind of thing that may actually get hospitals' attention. Um, the Biden administration has also recently taken steps to say that if pharmacists refuse to honor prescriptions for birth control or abortion drugs, or even other drugs, frankly, that are viewed as abortive patients that are not like lupus drugs, that are not even really being designated as abortion drugs, that uh, those um, that the Justice Department is pr planning on um, bringing suit, uh, essentially accusing those pharmacists and other providers of pregnancy discrimination under the title uh, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So again, I think up until that point, there had been a lot of, um, you know, convening groups to study what could be done, but not really doing anything. I think that had been kind of the theme of much of what the Biden administration had done. And really the executive order is a lot of that too. There's a lot of sort of, I'm going to instruct various federal stakeholders to consider what they could do without spelling out what they were going to do. And we're still in that position when it comes, for example, to, um, the availability of medication abortion, which is something that people have been spotlighting as a potential area of federal involvement, the idea that the Biden administration could take the position that FDA rules on medication abortion take precedence over contrary state law. We still don't know the extent to which the Biden administration is going to do that. Um, there are suits in the lower courts brought by company, a company that manufactures mifepristone, one of the drugs used in a two pill abortion protocol. The Biden administration has not intervened in that case, is not commenting on that case. So we don't really know um, what's going on with that. But I, I think that to the extent the administration's response is evolving, it's evolving toward one with more teeth and that would be good. But so far I think we, very much remains to be seen. Definitely want to get more into medication abortion a little later, but um, to answer this this question on the federal government's response, Jane, what, what has been your reaction? Well, I, I think the federal response is good, and we do need to protect the doctors and other providers in the non-banned states who, for example, facilitate the me medication abortions by prescribing and sending pills to patients in non-abortion states. But I also think that people like us on this panel and in the audience, uh, very probably in the audience, often concentrate too much on the federal level. Your question was all about the federal level. And the state governments in the non-banned states have a major role to play here in protecting their providers who want to help women in the abortion banned states and in facilitating, um, for example, travel from abortion banned states. We, we need to... Um, really support our state governments in Massachusetts. We've been pretty good. And it's the state governments that are going to play quite an important role here, not just the federal government. Absolutely. Evelyn, how about you? You know, I, I think everything that's been said is good. But I do think it's in, in this short amount of time since the, the world has changed, I think it's time for us to take a broader, more comprehensive look of, at the role of the federal government versus people who are, in my view, systematically and insisting on states' rights, a return to very, very prominent focus on states' rights. Uh, for me, as a, a, a U.S. historian, that's a dangerous moment. That's a dangerous moment. I think the federal government response cannot be piecemeal. It can't be, let's look at, you know, the, the particulars of each state's response, but rather look at what is the overarching uh, role of the federal government in, protect, in, in supporting equal protection under the law and bodily autonomy. There is a very serious program being put forward by those people who supported the overturning of Roe to go for a, a federal ban on abortion. The, the, this cannot, a federal ban on abortion, if, if there's steam behind that effort, those policies that will ultimately support that, then piecemeal approaches by the federal government or the support even of, uh, as Jenny just said, 
of particular states where the where where there is where there are no bans, then we'll be good, but they won't be enough. And so I do think it's time for, for certainly those of us who who uh, oppose the overturning of Roe to take a much more comprehensive look and stop being distracted by a certain kind of misinformation and distortion, both of the historical record and of current practices that keep us from seeing that there's a very serious big agenda here. And that agenda speaks to equal protection under the law for women and bodily autonomy. And I don't, and as long as the, the policies don't actually go at those two issues, from my perspective, I, I don't see the policies ultimately uh, supporting uh, the return of uh, protection for women's rights. And Liz, do you have thoughts on the Biden administration's response so far or the federal government's role going forward? One thing that I will add is that I think it has been surprising to many folks how surprised the Biden administration seemed to be by the ruling and the lag. I know we've been reminded it's only been three weeks since the ruling. It's been six. It's been six. There were six weeks before that when we knew what exactly what was going to be in the ruling. Um, but we really knew this moment was going to come the night Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. That's the night I accepted Roe versus Wade was going to be overturned. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that that there hasn't been time to prepare a robust response, I think, is false. Um, and so I, I, my critique of the Biden administration would be uh, where I don't think we're seeing the full throated response that that the other panelists have called for here. Um, and what we have seen come out has been more piecemeal and more delayed than folks might have expected, given how clearly um, this moment was anticipated and how clearly, for example, it's been anticipated by people who oppose abortion rights and are very much ready to um, move forward their agenda and capitalize on this moment. So. Um, that, that's my nutshell response is that I think we could have expected something a little more robust as well as more detailed and more immediate, given that this was in no way a surprise. One thing that didn't come up just now, but has, it's an idea that's been floated um, by some politicians on the left is the idea of setting up abortion clinics on federal land, whether that is something that um, the Biden administration could do. Mary, Maybe you can address what's the feasibility um, of clinics on federal land. I think that a lot of the solutions that have been proposed that the Biden administration could take kind of fall into the category of legally feasible, but not slam dunks, right? So the clinics on federal land piece, I think the anxieties for folks who are skeptical of that are kind of twofold. One, there's concerns about just safety, right? Kind of the practical ramifications of having an abortion clinic in the middle of the state that's very anti-abortion where they could become magnets potentially for violence. I think there's also fears that states would simply try to arrest people at those clinics and set up clashes that may ultimately end up at the US Supreme Court, the same Supreme Court obviously that just decided Dobbs. And then there are kind of legality questions. I think anytime the federal government is doing something that looks like financially supporting or subsidizing abortion, there's going to be questions about whether that's barred by um, the Hyde Amendment and various other policies that prevent federal direct federal support for abortion. The argument would be that obviously federal land isn't the same thing as Medicaid reimbursement for abortion or, you know, the kinds of prohibitions on direct support for abortion we see in the Affordable Care Act. And that's true, right? But again, that's something we would expect to see go to court. The criticism I think we've seen from, from people like Senator Elizabeth Warren and others essentially is that the Biden administration has a lot of options that fall into that same category, right? Options that are not sure things, but that could potentially be effective if they worked. And it isn't really trying any of them. And so I think there's a sort of impulse of maybe it wouldn't work, but the Biden administration should be doing something more than saying essentially um, what it has been saying, which isn't totally wrong, but essentially Congress would be a better place for federal action on abortion and without a better Congress the options available to the Biden administration are limited. That's not entirely wrong, but I think people who are critical of the administration are saying essentially that doesn't mean the Biden administration can't try anything, which is in fact, in part what we've seen. I mean, we've seen consideration of some options. Um, I don't think the response is over, but there has been a lot of hesitation to, to move into legal gray areas like leasing um, federal land for clinics. Uh, and I, I think that's a fair diagnosis. 
I want to talk about um, the default response uh, by many women who are seeking abortions right now in abortion hostile states, which has been to travel to other states where abortion is legal. And we are seeing, we are expecting to see huge waves of abortion seekers coming from red states into uh, blue states or states with more lenient abortion laws uh, to get their procedures. What are some of the challenges of this approach? That's a question that I want us to address. Um, but I also want to bring in a viewer question that's related to this. This is from Aisha, and she's wondering um, how people who want to help abortion seekers uh, come to states where abortion is legal, how can those helpers know their rights? Where, where are they at risk legally? So Mary, I'm going to send it back to you um, to kick us off on this one. So I'm going to sketch some sort of broad areas of concern. Um, state law on this is very much in flux, so I don't want to say that what I'm about to say is not the final word on this. So the first thing to know is that if you are donating to an abortion fund, or you have a website that provides information about self-managed abortion, or you're just posting something like that on your Facebook, what I'm about to say is true now and it may not be true in a week. So the first thing to do is that if you are interested in helping on this, you need to stay up to date because this is constantly changing. Areas of concern are several. Um, one of the clearest is that states have been interested in both expansively de defining aiding and abetting, to reach what um, is in most cases speech, right? So um, the National Right to Life Committee, which is one of the largest national anti-abortion groups has a model law that would define as aiding and abetting, you know, being an abortion doula, having a website that explains how to have a self-managed abortion, even frankly, if it, you know, was Evelyn was doing work on the history of science and had a description of that in her scholarship. It's not clear whether that would be aiding and abetting. There's were uh, people who are um, kind of right on the edge of the difference between advocacy and advice, barring people, for example, in conservative states from giving referrals to doctors in states that would provide abortion. All of that would be considered aiding and abetting. We've seen similar definitions used in Texas to cover people who are contributing to abortion funds. Um, so that's an area of concern. And the other area of concern is that we know that states are interested in applying their rules, not just to people in their own states. So you may have this concern, for example, if you live in Texas or Alabama and you want to donate to an abortion fund, but you may also justifiably have this concern if you live in Massachusetts or California and want to do that because states have been taking the position that their laws um, can apply out of state. Um, we heard from Brett Kavanaugh in the Dobbs decision, hey, don't worry about that, everybody. There's the right to travel. Um, I don't think it's as simple as that because some, one, some abortion opponents are saying we actually are going to pass laws saying you can't travel or you can't support people who are traveling. And the way we're going to keep that out of federal court is the same way Texas's SB8, which you may have heard of, which allowed everybody with no connection to an abortion to sue. We're going to use that same strategy to keep people from mounting a constitutional challenge. So that may happen. It may happen that the law says if you donate to an abortion fund, um, we're going to punish you, not travel directly, but kind of out of state conduct. Um, I don't think that that will always work. I think many progressive states have been passing laws that would protect people from, for example, criminal extradition uh, for laws that are, are for conduct that is either legal or even constitutionally protected in the context of abortion or speech. Um, states, progressive states have started passing rules protecting their citizens from that kind of lawsuit. But um, I think having said all of that, if this is something that you're interested in doing, it's worth doing a little homework on digital privacy before you do to avoid what would be potentially legal nightmare or headache that may ultimately result in nothing happening to you. But I don't want people to say, okay, my state has these protections, so I'm going to just post this on Facebook and not worry about it. You don't want the kind of headache or annoyance that, or and even potential liability, because this is such an uncertain area of the law that could come with this. So if you're going to help, I think, do your homework on digital privacy first. Um, don't find out later that you should have. Mm. Right. I mean, this idea of travel being the solution for the patchwork abortion landscape in our country is, um, is, is somewhat 
uh, flawed because there are so many hurdles uh, to people who are trying to travel to get an abortion. And you, you touched upon that, Mary. I mean, it's an expensive procedure. It gets more and more expensive the longer you wait, but it takes time uh, to book travel, to get time off of work, to find that money for the procedure. Um, so many, many obstacles to people uh, who would be looking to travel. And we're also looking at an increased strain on the healthcare system overall, but especially I would imagine in states that are taking more out-of-state abortion patients, especially states in um, sort of like critical geographic junctures like Kansas, Illinois, serving now a much wider um, geographic population. Liz, can you tell us a little bit about what are the repercussions of this increased strain on um, hospitals and, and clinics in some of these blue states that are expecting to see an uptick in abortion patients? Absolutely. Um, I think an important piece of kind of baseline information about why this is happening is that 95% of abortions in the United States occur in freestanding clinics that specialize in sexual and reproductive health. So that's where the care is concentrated and has been since actually before Roe um, in the states that did allow abortion before Roe. And only 5% are taking place, therefore, in hospitals and doctor's offices. It's those freestanding clinics that already are providing all these services that are going to absorb folks who are traveling. And the first effect is longer wait times for services. So we've seen this already in Texas because of SB8, which Mary was just talking about, which is the um, six week ban that went into effect in September of 2021. As a result of that ban passing, um, the wait for an abortion in Oklahoma, a neighboring state that had clinics receiving a lot of travelers, went from five days to 21 days. So I think that's the first thing we're going to see is that in all these states where folks are traveling to, the wait for care is going to go up. Um, that happens very quickly over a matter of days, weeks, and months. That in turn means that some folks are going to be too far along to get an abortion by the time they get there. So we're gonna see more denials of care, even by folks who are attempting travel. Um, as those institutions are overwhelmed, however, I do think it's important to remember that there's so much that other components of the healthcare system can do to improve access, particularly for residents of their own state. So um, one thing that I would call on the provider community to think about, the healthcare provider community more broadly to think about is how can your primary care practice, your hospital, your generalist GYN practice start providing abortion for your own patients rather than you referring them to the clinic down the street. Because at bit, what people are doing now is they are referring all their own patients to these freestanding clinics in their states, even though they're perfectly qualified clinically and have all the supplies and expertise to safely deliver abortion care to their own states, to their own patients. So we can relieve a lot of the pressure on these freestanding clinics um, by having patients who are residents of the state and already hooked into the healthcare system in a place like California, New York, Massachusetts, Illinois, New Mexico, to be able to stay in the healthcare system where they get the rest of their care and not have to go to these specialty clinics will free up capacity um, for folks to come in from other states. And so I think that's a positive intervention that people in the healthcare sector can take um, if they're in a state where abortion is going to remain legal. But I, but I think in, uh, in, in response to that, one of the things we have to keep in mind, the impact on poor women who already have limited access to general health care, right? Many of whom still do not have uh, primary care physicians uh, that they can uh, have the kind of relationship with that they would be able to, to uh, be innovative uh, and, and help sustain uh, of people's overall health by taking care of them themselves rather than making these referrals. And I think, again, it's asking, it's asking the people with the least amount of resources, the least amount of vacation time, the lowest, many of them at an economic level where they don't have much control over their, their work, um, to be able to engage in this kind of um, uh, interaction with the healthcare system that frankly, has not yet shown that it's willing to stretch and support uh, and provide greater access for poor women. It's poor women who are going to suffer here. Uh, and, and, and I don't think we can forget that. And I think the provider community, uh, especially those who have a commitment to public health, are going to have to put that front and center, that our system doesn't work well for poor, poor folks in this country. And if we want it to work even better now in the, in this, in, in the shadow of overturning Roe, people are going to have to step up to the plate in ways that there's not a lot of evidence that they have been willing to do so. 
thank you for jumping in and reminder to all the panelists, please feel free to jump off of each other's comments. Don't let me interrupt you. Um, if there are no more thoughts on that particular point, though, I do think it's important for us to talk about medication abortion. Um, according to the Guttmacher Institute, which is an abortion rights advocacy research group, as of 2020, the majority of abortions in the United States were done by medication. So this is abortion by pill rather than surgical procedure. Um, medication abortion can be used 70 days or less since the first day of a woman's last period. And so to start us off on the topic of medication abortion, um, let's listen to another Reuters clip. This is an interview with a woman in Texas who self-managed her abortion using pills. Reuters spoke with the 29-year-old Texan who, earlier this year, chose what's known as a self-managed abortion. The woman, who wishes to remain anonymous, is a homeowner with two degrees and a stable job. If you look at me on paper and you might say, that's an ideal situation for a person uh, who finds themselves pregnant. But at the end of the day, I was pregnant and I didn't want to be, and I didn't need any other reason besides that to say, I am going to seek an abortion. So medication abortions are being talked about more and more as sort of a workaround, some of the state bans potentially in our post-Roe country. But there are a lot of questions about how they work. So Liz, can you explain to us how the two-part um, medication abortion pills work? How safe are they? And what is the legality of using them at this point? Sure. Um, so the evidence-based regimen for a medication abortion is a dose of mifepristone followed by a dose of another drug called misoprostol. And mifepristone is a pill you've probably heard of and thought about as the abortion pill. It can also be used for miscarriages. Misoprostol is a drug with a wider range of uses that's more widely available for all kinds of indicate for several indications. Um, and they can be used in combination or a person can use misoprostol alone. And both of those regimens, mifepristone and misoprostol together or misoprostol alone are highly effective. Um, they are between 97 and 99% effective, depending on the study that you look at. Um, and when we say effective, that means that a person is, succeeds in passing their pregnancy tissue without any kind of surgical intervention. Um, so medication alone is enough to empty the uterus. Uh, for the folks for whom that doesn't work, then sometimes follow-up care and a uterine evacuation is needed. Um, in terms of safety, they're very safe. The complication rate is extremely low um, and serious complications are rare. And they're actually rare no matter how you get the pills. And this is something that we've newly learned because of some really new data coming out of the COVID pandemic and the deregulation of mifepristone in Canada. So we know that mifepristone and misoprostol are very safe if someone gets them at a clinic, that they pick them up in person after visiting a doctor or, or healthcare provider. If someone gets them by mail, they're just as safe. If someone picks them up from a pharmacy, um, in, as they do in Canada, they dispense mifepristone like any other drug in pharmacies, just as safe. And also very safe if people self-source these medications with no formal contact uh, with the formal medical care system. And we know that mostly from international literature, looking at places like Argentina and Nigeria, where there's been a long practice of people self-sourcing these medications and then having an abortion with the support of lay health workers um, rather than trained healthcare professionals. And that is safe. And that's actually newly recognized as a safe mode of abortion by the World Health Organization in new guidance that they just issued in May 2022. So we know that um, the pills are very safe and we know they're really, they seem to be safe kind of no matter how you get them. Um, we also know from the research literature that when folks order pills online in the United States, they usually get real drugs. So there was a study on this from an organization called Genuity um, that ordered a bunch of pills from different websites and did uh, testing to see what was in them. And they found that most of them contained mifepristone at around the right dosage. Um, in terms of legality, I think that uh, what I will say about legality, which is not, not gonna be my, my greatest area of expertise to answer, um, but there's a mifepristone is regulated by the uh, a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy by the FDA, which is kind of an extra set of guidance that puts extra barriers or protections on the use of a drug. Um, and to comply with those, providers need to self-certify that they are able to date a pregnancy um, and patients have to sign a special form. But under those regulations, it's now legal, um, according to the FDA, to mail this drug in the United States. So that, that is now legal. Um, 
there are different ways to get the pills. As I said, you can get them in a clinic, you can get them from a doctor through a telehealth visit or, um, or from a clinician through a telehealth visit, but you can also self-source these drugs. And so for folks who are considering um, obtaining the pills outside of the formal medical care system, I would say um, there's a great website called Plan C Pills that lists the different places you can get the pills and alerts you to whether or not that particular place is in a legal gray zone. So you can go to this organization, plancpills.org, and you can see a brick and mortar clinic that will you know, give you the drug by telehealth, perfectly legal. Um, and then you can also see some other places where folks get pills like online pharmacies, and they'll have a little note there that there's more of a legal gray zone to alert people that that might be something to consider as they decide whether or not to go down that avenue. Great. And because we're running a little short on time, and I do want to get to more of our audience questions, I'm going to quickly jump to the topic of politics. Uh, we have the midterm elections coming up 2022 this fall, and abortion seems to be a topic that will uh, definitely influence uh, how voters are thinking about the election. So, Jane, I want to go to you. Voters who are concerned about the diminishing re uh, abortion access in their state and in, in this country, what should they be thinking about um, as we look at the fall elections? Well, first, of course, this imperative question to all candidates who should be asked in the debates is, do you support a ban on abortion at the federal level? Um, and such a ban, of course, would be a catastrophe, but it's very possible if Republicans win both houses of Congress and the presidency. So asking that question would alert independents and responsible Republicans to vote against candidates who favor such a ban. And that question would also expose the extremism in the Republican Party to make what's left of the moderate center in that party question further where the party's going. It would really reveal, tear away the curtain and really let people know where their candidates stand. So I think it's a very important question to ask in every debate. Do you support a ban on abortion at the federal level? And in addition, I think that voters who care about these issues should be working for and giving money to long-term community organizing in um, swing states. Get out the vote long-term, get out the vote projects like um, the Movement Voter Project and other vo projects that are at this moment, going and find and bringing out what will be the vote in the next elections, those those votes are going to be crucial in our country. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn to a couple of our audience questions before we wrap up. This one is from Layla, and it looks like uh, maybe Mary, you might be best positioned to answer this one. If Congress were to codify Roe and Casey into law, how easily might that be ruled unconstitutional? Well, I mean, it, potentially it would, right? I mean, so a Congress, uh, generally speaking, Congress has to have some kind of specific warrant when it passes laws. Um, often Congress looks either to the Commerce Clause or to what's called Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, which gives Congress not the ability to identify new constitutional protections, but to provide remedies when the Supreme Court has identified constitutional protections. As you can imagine, um, passing a federal protection for abortion rights would not be easy to do under the 14th Amendment because the Supreme Court has just finished telling us that there are no constitutional protections for abortion rights. That would leave Congress most likely looking at the Commerce Clause, essentially the argument being that um, state laws on abortion interfere with the delivery of medical care across state lines and with a variety of other services that are adjacent to abortion. Um, that's Certainly a plausible theory, the Civil Rights Act, um, various civil rights laws, in fact, have been based on the Commerce Clause and draw on similar logic. But we know that several of the conservatives on the Supreme Court um, are unhappy with broad interpretations of the Commerce Clause. We know as well that they're not exactly supportive of access to abortion. So I would, in fact, be surprised if they did not strike down uh, such a federal law, um, which points to the, the sort of um, the Supreme Court being an ongoing issue in this. Um, they're going to be an ongoing issue when we get into conflicts about interstate travel, because as you can imagine, those are conflicts between states. Those will inevitably end up in federal court and appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the same, of course, is true uh, with federal legislation. Um, 
and then that just gets into complicated questions about do you reform the court? How do you reform the court? Do you ignore the court? How do you ignore the court? Uh, but but I think that there would be a real risk there. There's an interesting question to Jane's point: if Congress passed a federal ban on abortion, would that be constitutional? Um, I think given the law as it stands, the Supreme Court could probably distinguish the two by saying we didn't rule out the idea that a fetus was a rights holding person, um, much as we ruled out the idea that there's a right to abortion. So I could definitely see this. Supreme Court upholding a federal ban and striking down federal protection for abortion rights. This is a question from Suzanne, and anyone can take this one, but I think it's an important point that um, we haven't really addressed yet. The overturning of Roe v. Wade is very likely going to have an economic impact uh, in this country. The question is, do you think women can continue to make gains in business and economic settings if they don't have autonomy over their bodies and reproductive health? I guess I would just point out that um, many women didn't have autonomy over their bodies and reproductive health even before this opinion. And so uh, it's certainly shocking and shocks the conscience to have this right taken away. Um, but for some people, it was already just a right on paper and not a right in their actual lives. And so that broader goal of supporting people's reproductive autonomy and human thriving is much bigger than the issue of abortion itself. Right. And we know that in the United States, we've had this soaring inequality um, so that the rich women are not going to be too badly off. They're going to continue being successes. The poor women are going to be hurt the most. Yeah, and I think regional inequalities are going to be really pronounced here. It's worth emphasizing that the states with the strongest laws against abortion are also states that have the worst um, outcomes for children, highest rates of maternal mortality for people of color and other people, um, you know, lowest rates of healthcare access for those people. These are often not states that have expanded Medicaid. And so I think that it's not just going to be a rich poor issue, because if you are, you know, arguably, I mean, you can, they're going to be relatively wealthier people in conservative states with worse health outcomes, health, health outcomes than so some lower income people in more progressive states. So I think that there are going to be kind of multiple layers of inequality that are going to affect people's ability to thrive. And there, that may have kind of broader fallout. I mean, I've, I've read recent stories about people reconsidering decisions about where to go to college because of this kind of question. So I think, um, but I just uh, emphasize that there, there are different kinds of inequalities we'd expect to see exacerbated. Absolutely. Um, I know we're a little over time. So to finish up, we've covered a lot of ground today, we've made a lot of really interesting thought-provoking points. I want to conclude with another lightning round, everyone just going around and giving your best piece of advice um, for how we move forward in a post-row world. Who would like to kick us off? Well, I'll start. Um, I think that one of the most important things all of us can do right now is to not focus so uh, specifically on uh, the issue of abortion, but really think hard about the fragmentation of our healthcare system, the uh, the fragmentation and uh, inability to get out uh, accurate information about uh, health to the American people. The fragmentation of public health and medicine that's been revealed through COVID is just going to get worse. And so I think people need to take a much broader perspective toward these things. And ultimately, this is about intersectional justice and equity. Keep our eyes on the prize. Voting suppression is a part of this discussion as well. Economic inequality is a part of this discussion as well. It's not a single issue uh, that is on the table in front of us. Roe is just a representative of a broader agenda of a small group of uh, arguably political, politically ideological folks who uh, sorry, I'm just going to say white men who do not want women to have control of their bodies. And we have to face the real hard questions associated with that. So I think it's time. What I say to my son uh, is it's time. I, I didn't know I was going to be marching in the streets with him, but I'm going to be marching in the streets now with him. We have to take back. We've come too far to fail. I'll just get a couple of simple things. Elect Democrats. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and prevent a federal abortion ban. 
and stress the struggle so many women have with so little support from society to care well for their existing children. And when they get an abortion, it's often to help those existing children, which society is not helping to support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say three things. I mean, I think Evelyn's right that we need to do more, focus more on reproductive justice issues that are not abortion, because in conservative states, there's not going to be access to abortion in the near term. There's just not. So if there's ways to do more to, for example, protect pregnant workers against discrimination or expand Medicaid access. Those are things we should do to kind of blunt some of the harms. When we're thinking about voting, I would stress voting in local, becoming more informed about and more active in state and local elections. When these laws are ambiguous, the people who are interpreting them are local prosecutors and law enforcement. When we're determining whether these laws are constitutional as a matter of state law, there are state judges who are interpreting them. Those people are sometimes elected. They're sometimes subject to retention elections. Those are areas that are going to be really crucial. And of course, what determines whether these laws are laws? Who sits for the most part in state legislatures and in governor's mansions? I'm not underestimating the threat of a national ban, but that require getting rid of the filibuster. That may not happen. And at least recent history tells us that a lot of things happen in the states when it comes to abortion. So I think being more active on that front. And then finally, I think trying to re- rethink how we view this issue. This is absolutely an issue for women and other people who are pregnant. But I think, as Evelyn said, this is also a democracy issue. What it took for us to get here has changed a lot about our democracy. And I think at times when we say this is a women's issue or this is an issue for pregnant people, that's implying that other people shouldn't care, other people should remain silent, other people, it's basically not other people's problem. And if we understand the history that brought us to Roe, we would understand this has absolutely changed things that will affect everybody and that what happens to pregnant people in general affects everyone. So I would change even how you think about this so that you're not sort of inadvertently um, shirking responsibility. Just um, echo and uplift a few of those points by adding that I think one of the one of the urgent interventions that's needed in the short term to help mitigate the negative sequelae of this decision is to address the crisis of Black maternal mortality in the United States, and specifically to address inter the role of interpersonal racism in producing that crisis. Um, and the poor treatment and racist and discriminatory treatment that Black women have by healthcare professionals in this country is a, is a leading cause of death. So if folks are being forced to carry pregnancies to term, that's a gross violation of their human rights, but keeping them as safe as possible in the course of that pregnancy and protecting them from the effects of racism is an imperative for our healthcare system. And one that I am not at all confident that the states that are banning abortion will take seriously. Um, and so I think we, you know, we'll probably see a worsening crisis um, and we'll probably see disparities get worse, but I would, what I would love to see is for disparities to actually close because we're beginning to really take that crisis um, more seriously. And when I say we, obviously there are many women, particularly women of color activists who have taken the maternal mortality crisis very seriously. But for people who up to this point have only paid attention to abortion, it's time to start paying attention um, to maternity care more broadly when, and asking yourself, what can you do? Um, and in that mode of involvement, I think it's also really important to remember to follow the lead of groups who've been doing the work for a long time. So when we hear about you want to help folks getting an abortion, follow the lead of abortion funds that have been funding abortion for 40 years. Um, if you want to work on maternal mortality, follow the lead of Black women activists who have been leading the charge on maternal mortality for decades, um, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, because those people's experience actually being on the front lines it gives them the wisdom to do the best possible job and the role of folks who have not been as engaged up until this point is to approach with humility and ask what can i do of the people who know a little more um the last thing i would say is i think it's you know it's there's so many repercussions beyond reproductive health and beyond the bodily autonomy of people with uteruses because we know this is also the beginning of taking away trans rights and same-sex marriage. And um, a lot of rights are vulnerable to, because of overturning Roe versus Wade and because of what was written in the opinion. So from a public health perspective, this is gonna be a growing crisis um, as more and more folks become vulnerable under the law. Um, and so I think as public health practitioners, we really have to keep our eye on solidarity, on compassion and, um, and be ready for things to get a lot worse.
I want to thank all of our speakers for the really important discussion today and all the organizers and the audience for submitting such great questions. If you miss any part of today's program, you will be able to view it on the Harvard Chan School's YouTube channel. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. This concludes. Thank you.